Many years ago, probably about seven or eight years ago now, I got into an argument with a friend from America. I don't remember what the context was, but I remember him saying something along the lines of, well, my accent is the original British accent from the colonists and yours came after. I didn't really get this take at all, since there wasn't a single British accent to speak of. There never has been. Every region, city, and hilltop has had its own accent for hundreds of years. Hell, even the birds have regional accents. How could my friend's accent have been the accent for the entirety of Britain? I just thought he was talking a load of fluff and moved on from that. A couple years later, when I cared enough to do some actual research, I found out that the claim had some actual basis to it. The accent that was taken over to the New World did exist at the time, both at home and in the colonies. Unfortunately for my lovely American friend, it was a little more complicated than that. Let's take a look at some history of some accents across the English-speaking world, because apparently surface-level linguistics is something we like here on the channel. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so before I begin, I want to say that I'll be using the term British to refer to just English in this case. Scotland and Wales have their own accents, and Northern Ireland is a whole other ordeal entirely. You know it as the British accent, I know it's the British accent. Let's just leave it at that. I'll also be using accent and dialect interchangeably, as they're technically different, but that doesn't really matter to this story, and they intertwine enough for me to give that a pass. Okay? Okay, let's go. Early on, English was barely a single language. It was more of a string of vaguely mutually intelligible dialects, kind of like Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian. When the Anglo-Saxons first landed in Britain, they brought along the linguistic quirks of their homelands with them, leading to linguistics being one of the few things that truly differentiate Anglo from Saxon. These proto-English dialects ran almost entirely along national and ethnic lines, and can be separated into four main camps. Kentish was a dialect based on the old Jutish tongue from modern-day Denmark. Very little remains of this dialect, and it's not really important. Sorry. Northumbrian is the youngest dialect of the four. Despite this, Northumbrian and its descendants covered the largest tract of land of the bunch, stretching from Sheffield all the way up to Glasgow. With foreign invasions through the centuries, Northumbrian would come to splinter into what we would now call Scottish, Geordie, and Yorkshire dialects. But that's not really important to this story. I'll talk more about that on a future episode of England in Beta. Mercian was the middle dialect, taking up most of England's interior. Mercian didn't quite have the same linguistic breakup as Northumbrian, nor was Mercia quite as literary as their Northumbrian neighbours. As such, Mercian experienced a much more gradual split, mainly between the Mercian heartlands around modern-day Birmingham and East Anglia, where their accent and dialect would become much more subdued. In the end, West Saxon was kind of the one that won out. With Alfred the Great and his descendants beating back the Vikings and uniting England, their accent and dialect would become the standard for the duration of Anglo-Saxon rule. By the time of the Norman invasions, however, that hegemony would come to an end, and any standardisation of English would be torn apart in favour of Norman French. Right! For this portion of the video, I thought it'd be a fun idea to give it to someone who actually has the accent it's about. Everybody, this is Tom, a good friend of mine and a Wessex native. I'll let him take this one from here. Hello. Even with the Norman conquest putting written English on a nice edge, the West Saxon accent would come to be the lingua franca of much of the common folk, spreading to encompass much of southern England. Sure, the common traits of the accent would dilute and warp somewhat as it travelled from place to place, but the core aspects of the dialect, most famously the heavily pronounced letter R's, would remain. The winds of change were fast approaching, however. 
As the Hundred Years' War raged on in France through much of the 14th and 15th centuries, the English nobility would want to distance themselves from the Frenchmen that they had spent god knows how many years butting heads with. As such, these nobles would shed the last vestiges of their Norman roots and become proper Englishmen once more. Naturally, with much of the gentry living in southern England, the heavily rhotic Common English would no longer be seen as a peasant vernacular, but as the spoken language of all. Of course, this would be the common tongue of the people that in 1601 would come to form the Roanoke, Jamestown, and Plymouth colonies in the New World, later becoming the 13 colonies of British North America. And also Upper Canada as well. For the next 200 years or so, even with an ocean between the two, the British and American accents would remain mostly the same, bar the occasional slang word here or there. As you and I both know, the perfectly parallel pronunciations of British and American English would eventually diverge, for as far and as widely spoken as the descendants of the Wessex dialect were, a sudden change in the whims of the English upper class would bring the preeminence of the dialect tumbling back to where it came from. But that part is Em's job, not mine. While the Wessex accent and its descendants had been spreading themselves all across England's southern half, one place it never took off were the counties of East Anglia, Essex, and most importantly, Middlesex, which contained much of the city of London. The people here had for years spoken in a descendant of the Mercian dialect that too had warped and become more diluted than its predecessor. Much like how the old Norman aristocracy viewed the Wessex accents, the gentry of early modern England viewed this strange Anglian dialect as vulgar, lazy, and perhaps most prevalently, improper. This didn't stop the people of London and the South East from just speaking this accent anyway. In fact, they had the upper hand, as English as a written language had been preserved by and was fine-tuned for the speech patterns of the merchants and lesser nobles of Anglian strongholds of London, Cambridge, and Oxford. However, by the turn of the 18th century, and seemingly without any clear reason whatsoever, some of the more educated nobles would twist and refine the local Anglian dialect of the accent of London into their own. Seriously, I couldn't find any concrete reason as to why this happened. A few websites here and there would give some basic reasoning of, oh, because prestige, or because Americans, but I couldn't find any historical backing. It just sort of happened. Even without any proper rhyme or reason, this accent took off among the upper classes until it, like the Wessex accents of old, became the standard for both written and spoken English, finally binding the two together again for the first time in a thousand years. This is the accent that would spread across the world and give Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa their distinct dialects. This is the accent that would go on to define the Victorian era, the BBC, and 2013 Tumblr. The accent that is officially referred to by the government as received pronunciation, but the one you know as the British accent. So after all these years, was my friend right all along? Are Americans the vanguard of an ancient dialect lost to centuries of transformation, erosion, and the whims of the English nobility? Do the Americans really have the original British accent? The answer is... eh, not really. The accent never really went away, nor was it the only accent spoken in England. It's a claim that's incredibly misinformed in the long term and only works if you decide to retcon most of English history and pretend that anywhere north of Oxford doesn't exist. In conclusion, we should just go back to speaking Old Kentish instead. Thank you for watching.